Hello, this is Professor David Bashai, and this is Part C of our lecture on policies to narrow health disparities. In the first part of this lecture, we talked about the difference between process and outcomes. And we saw that most of the time, people don't listen to Cicero, who says that there is this big division between those who want to make processes equal but aren't sufficiently attentive to outcomes, and people who say, all I want to do is equalize outcomes, and they're not attentive to the equal processes. That insufficient attention is a big problem in health economics. The reason is that simply equalizing the processes will not lead to equal outcomes. I wish it would. I wish it was so simple that the Cicero problem would just go away and all we had to do was to create an equal process in the health economy and kaboom, all outcomes would be equal. It doesn't work that way and people don't know it, but now you listening to this lecture will know it. It's so important, I'm going to say it one more time. Equal processes in a health economy will not lead to equal outcomes. So you, as a recipient of this lecture, will always want to do both. Don't just work on Cicero's equal outcomes side. Don't just work on equal processes side. We need institutions that do equalization of processes because that matters for the feeling of justice. But don't trust equal processes. They're not enough. They never will be. We must also work on equal outcomes because, as I'm arguing in the prior part of the lecture, we care about the outcomes of our fellow human beings. Let's be a little bit more rigorous in how we define process equity and outcome equality. We use the word equity for processes. We achieve process equity when everybody has the same chance of getting medical services when they're sick and preventive services when well. We take stock of who is getting services and we try to make the reach of our processes similar. Equal quality, equal access to services. At the bottom of the slide, outcome equality, we use the word equality in this case, is achieved when everybody rates their health status the same or everybody has the same death risk. Obviously impossible. Nobody ever thinks this is possible. However, we saw tremendous disparities between men and women, between race and ethnicity, between income groups. We just want to make those differences smaller, and we can make them smaller. Many places do make them smaller, and we want to drive equality towards more equality rather than less equality, as long as we have these interpersonal preferences in our utility functions. These concerns for justice seem to be part of the human condition. Let's go over some explanations about uh, this major thesis of why would it be the case that equal processes do not lead to equal health outcomes. Four possible answers, and you get to pick multiple answers in this quiz question. So in the quiz question, so in this quiz question, I said all of these are possible good reasons. I would note that reason A is much more of a biological hard stopping rule, and reasons B, C, and D give us the movement to create new policies that can do better than the past. All right, let's begin to think about ways we can create policies that create equity of processes to take stock of our services and find a way to equalize the access to services. The principle here is really redistribution. Find people who do not have access to services, mostly because they don't have the income to pay for them, and then subsidize their access to services. Health insurance does this. And we have systems for health insurance that can be expanded to the poor. We know we've got programs like Medicaid, which can be income tested. We can also use outreach to the poor, find poor people and go knock on their door and bring them services. And that can be done selectively. The universal approach to process equity is to say, I'm not going to figure out your money or where you are, who you are. I'm just going to say everybody in our country gets this thing. Everybody gets health insurance or all health insurance has to cover vaccines. All health insurance has to cover screening for cancer. No matter who you are, where you are, you get 
a right to this form of, of health care processes. Now, I want to spend a moment giving you some of the best evidence for this thesis, and that comes from the Whitehall study. In the Whitehall study, we're studying the United Kingdom, and a basic real-life 40-year experiment that United Kingdom offered the world by starting an experiment where everybody was given an insurance card no matter who they were or how much money they had. This was a universal equity of process. Not only did everybody in England get an insurance card, the government said, you've got a general practitioner, a GP. There they are. It's Dr. Jones. There, there's, there's where they live. Go and make an appointment with your doctor. So everybody knows where their doctor is. Everybody knows that their doctor is free. The Whitehall hypothesis is that this would create outcome equality, that socioeconomic status differentials in mortality would be narrowed by the National Health Service. That's a great question. That's a hypothesis we can test scientifically. And I will now show you evidence based on this nature of an experiment to show that the NHS failed to completely eliminate mortality differentials. So the way the experiment works is that this is an experiment that started in 1948 when the government of the UK started to give the found the, the National Health Service. There was one look back study called Whitehall 1, which would really sort of cover the, the mid experiment treatment of the NHS. We start our experiment in 1948 and we say to 20 year old men, you get to start the experiment in 1948. We'll look back at you 20 years later. In 1968, we'll check on you and see if we've narrowed disparities in your health. Then we'll have a final look back in 1988, at which time you will have had 40 years of exposure to this treatment of the National Health Service. After 40 years of you having access to fully funded health care with a GP in your town who you can see whenever you want, will we have narrowed your health disparities? So let's look at the evidence. In 1968, we will look at differentials in the probability of ischemia. Ischemia is when an ECG reading shows that your heart had narrow arteries. The groups in England that were done in the Whitehall study, instead of income disparities, they're called social class disparities. On the left are administrators, on the right are clerical support workers, and in the middle is the, the middle uh, executive, the professional executive manager. What we find in the data is 20 years after treatment with the NHS in 1968, we have a disparity. We see that the, the bottom social class of clerical workers has about 4.5% have ischemia on their EKGs when they're 40 to 50 years old and uh, about three and a half percent in the black bar have those same uh, ECG findings. Now, there's not as much ischemia at age 40 than later. When we look back after 40 years, now the, the men are in their 60s to 70s, of course they're gonna have more coronary artery disease. And sure enough, the administrators got more, the middle executives got more heart disease and the clerical support workers got a lot more heart disease. So they had social class disparities when they were 20 years of treatment. Those got worse after 40 years of treatment. Now, ideally, no one would have gotten sick, but NHS, we're, we're not testing that it stopped you from getting blocked coronary arteries. What we're testing is, could they narrow the gradients? Could they make the gradient that we saw in 68 narrower? And no, they didn't didn't happen. Seeing your doctor every time you wanted to for free didn't seem to get the job done uh, more for the, the lower social class than the higher social class. All right, let's look at chronic bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis is a syndrome where because you often, because you smoke, you'll get a chronic cough and wheezing and trouble breathing. And here we see a lot more of that in the clerical workers, about 18% of them have chronic bronchitis as opposed to the administrators where about 9% have this condition. Good news, as they got older, all of them got less of this and surely the clerical workers 
had perhaps the greatest gains. They, as a percentage, they got a lot better. And part of how they got better probably was quitting smoking. But even after quitting smoking, we still see a gradient. We still see a gradient in chronic bronchitis after 40 years of treatment with this insurance program. So another indicator of disparities would be angina pectoris. Angina pectoris means telling your doctor that when I walk ex excessively or I run, my chest hurts, I get chest pain. This is something that, that affects about three to three and a half percent of the people in the study when they're in their 40s. And here you go, it seems to be a little less common in the high class administrators than it is in the other two social groups. 40 years later, it's a lot better as a percentage for the administrators, a lot better for the, the middle class workers, but not a lot different for the clerical support workers, still up in the three and a half percentage zone. So we still have these gradients in angina pectoris coming from blocked coronary arteries. Finally, let's show you at current tobacco smokers. In 1968, this is before the big Surgeon General's reports and everybody saying smoking is bad for you. Everybody kind of thought it was. But in 1968, that's when the big news about cigarettes, health harms came out. And at that time, there was a social gradient in smoking. About 28% of administrators were current cigarette smokers, and about 55% of these white clerical workers were cigarette smokers, uh, and in the middle, in the middle. And then after 40 years of seeing their doctor whenever they wanted to for free, we had reductions in tobacco smoking, but the social class gradient remained. That seeing your doctor regularly whenever you wanted did not close this gap in smoking problem, right? So by giving everybody access to a GP, they couldn't address the things that were creating these, these social class disparities in health. And one obvious explanation is that there were determinants of heart disease, bronchitis, smoking, that a, a GP is kind of not the answer for. These social determinants were not something that the doctors did in their office. To create social disparities, you have to get out of a doctor's office and create a social environment that is more supportive of the clerical workers uh, and help gives them an ecosystem where smoking doesn't make sense, where exercising, eating good food is the thing that they do as much as the administrators do. And a doctor's office is not the answer. It's not the tool for the job. So as a principle, this, these ways to pursue equity, the targeting, I am going to create unequal access to services with a means-tested program. I will give the poor a Medicaid card. Um, that's a tool that could be used to create process equity. Or I will blanket people with everybody getting the same type of a process with an an NHS card is another way. But if we want to move ahead, sharing community problems, identifying them and solving them might have a lot more going for it as a way to pursue long-lasting social equity. So let's come back to the U.S. now and look at inequality in life expectancy in the U.S. What we're seeing here is a map of Baltimore done about uh, 2012 which shows the, the, the long-lived places in Baltimore towards the, the north, northern border of the city, up in Guilford and Greater Roland Park, having life expectancies in the 80s. And the downtown areas, areas in Greenmount East, Clifton Berea, Upton and Druid Heights, having life expectancies of 65 to 67. Here uh, in the Homewood campus, where Johns Hopkins' main campus is, we're in the Waverleys, and as you cross Charles Street, this vertical line in the middle of the map is Charles Street. Uh, going north along Charles Street is this big divide. Uh, on the eastern side of Charles Street is a life expectancy in the 70s uh, and high 60s. On the western border of Charles Street in the Guilfords is a life expectancy in the high 70s, a 10-year life expectancy gap simply crossing Charles Street. 
So small areas make a big difference for the, the health of a small community, which leads to a question. Medicaid is available everywhere in the city. Medicaid doesn't end as you cross Charles Street, so targeting has its limits. Uh, the other thing that's happening in Baltimore is uh, another type of a service. So Medicaid doesn't seem to, to be something that could help address these small disparities. Be More for Healthy Babies is a program that the city has now been running for over uh, since the late 2008-2009. Uh, Be More for Healthy, baby, healthy Babies uh, will bring a community health worker and a nurse to your house if you are identified as having a high-risk pregnancy. High-risk pregnancies are more common in African-American and low-income families, and, and this has actually helped to close the gap. Until, up until about 2014, we were seeing a tremendous narrowing of health disparities across black and white pregnancies. Birth weights went up for black children, and infant mortality rates went down as a result of this very highly targeted approach. So it, it does work, it creates a solution. We don't know why it kind of stopped leading any benefits after 2014. Balti Market is an approach to uh, addressing food deserts as a targeted intervention. If you pass a means test and show that you're low income, you can participate in Balti Market and have subsidized food delivered to your door through online ordering. So it, if, if you're not, getting easy access to healthy food, Baltimore Market is a targeted program to address that and hopefully narrow disparities in nutritional related diseases such as, as heart disease and, and obesity. So these are targeted approaches. How about blanketed approaches? Things that are done for everybody. Clean water is the best example. No matter where you are in America, you can drink water that will not give you diarrhea. Great news. That is not the case in many, many other low-income countries still today, a hundred years after America was able to do this. We offer everybody in our public and private schools a common curriculum and the basic how to be healthy, how to brush your teeth and eat right. We create public goods that make our hospitals safe, that create safer roads, safer consumer products. has to be done for everybody. This is a public good. We can't exclude you or anybody from being in a safe hospital or a safe road. I'm going to spend the, the rest of the lecture talking about how all this happens. How do we get process equity and blanket equity uh, and equality in America? Does this just happen magically? No, it doesn't happen magically. There's a profession that wakes up every day to say, what can we do to make our community healthy? This is called a local health department. So public health departments are the country's health disparities solvers. They live in the U.S. at every county. There are 3,000 counties and about 3,000 health departments in the USA. Their mission, every health department's job, is to produce two public goods. The public good of health for all as measured by metrics like life expectancy, mortality, morbidity, hospitalizations, and rates of, of smoking and doing unhealthy things. And their other job, it's in their, their mission statement, is to narrow disparities across class, race, ethnicity, income group. They want to do that. They wake up saying, how can we do this? It's our job. So the Public Health Service was founded very early in our country. This is the national level entity that creates a national workforce. However, most of the health departments in the U.S. are funded locally by state and county. Globally, every country also has public health departments at the state and sub-state level, where they're, they're called parishes or districts or provinces. They'll have a local health department. We'll talk about how they're functioning in just a moment. In America, 3,000 county health departments, 50 state health departments, one federal government all of the money spent by all of these public health entities amounts to $80 billion a year. That's mostly local and state spending. The federal spending that can be called public health spending is this measly, tiny little $12 billion. So when the coronavirus epidemic is hitting America back in January and February, it only has ready $12 billion of federal money for the federal government to spend it. It also has $68 billion 
for state and local governments to spend on what will turn out to be a $1 trillion problem. The other problem with this $80 billion is that it has not been configured to be ready and nimble to solve a pandemic. Of the $80 billion that we spend, about a third isn't even public health. It really sick people treatment to treat people who have come down with chlamydia or gonorrhea or syphilis at an STD clinic and lots of health departments and counties run a clinic where you can say, I've got chlamydia, I need help, and they'll give you free drugs. Same with tuberculosis, same with HIV AIDS, same with drug addiction. Counties help treat people with these conditions for free. So that uses up about a third of the $80 billion leaving behind only about 60, 50 to 60 billion to do public health promotion and disparities problems. So this doesn't get done. Uh, the, the bad news is it's not funded. The good news is that you don't have to only spend your own money to help create solutions to health disparities. You can work with universities and foundations and local schools. Many people can bring food to this potluck of how to make the community healthy. It's not as though only the people paid for by the county health department can create health. The police make the roads safe, the school teachers teach health, on and on. There's a lot of public health activity that can be done outside of the health department, but still the health officer is the one who wakes up saying, the buck stops here. So just graphically to show you our funding, U.S. health spending in billions is these bars measured on the left-sided axis, and you know we're spending uh, $2.5 trillion on the left-sided axis, $2,500 billion on these blue bars. Uh, now, dramatic change in scale on the right-hand side bar showing that we're only spending $80 billion uh, on these public health activities by our governments. So what is going on in a local health department? Here's a diagram to show you how a public health department does its thing. Up in the sky here are these multiple social determinants of health. The food we eat, whether the police are treating us with respect and dignity, whether the public works are creating clean water and clean air, what we do in our households, whether clergy people are supporting good behaviors or not, housing, the things that make us healthy are up here. They're interrelated, multiple sectors, they have to coordinate. All of this has to happen. That is the that is where the battle is being fought. The health department, if you knock on the door and walk up and down the hall, you'll see a suite labeled communicable disease control. You'll see epidemiologists saying how much typhoid fever, how much swine flu this year, how much coronavirus, how much tuberculosis. They, they notify, they do contact tracing, they stop outbreaks. That's their thing. You go down the hall a little further, you'll find the chronic disease and injury prevention unit. How many car crashes are we having? How many suicides and homicides? Are youth violent, not violent? What can we do to stop youth violence? That's their thing. You'll find the maternal and child health department. Are pregnant women getting access to services? Are they smoking? Are they gaining weight? Are they losing weight? Are the children getting vaccinated? That goes on in the MCH department. You'll find the environmental health department. Are the wells getting inspected? Are the restaurants getting inspected? Is the food safe? That's their shtick. There is a universal health care coverage department, meaning are there uninsured people in this town that can't get care? Is the Affordable Care Act working out here? Is Medicaid reaching everybody? That's their thing. They're all here. They are doing process equity and outcome equality in these units. Underneath them are these supporting features. There is an epidemiological support unit for everybody. There's community partnerships so that we reach out to the community and make the entire community work together for health policy. Communications and social media. There's IT and legal and HR. And there is an activity where they want to accredit themselves using accreditation tools to do better. Now, accreditation is still voluntary in public health units. And very small number, uh, less than a tenth of counties have accredited their health departments. But if they wanted to do their job better, they could do all of their jobs better. Again, they only have $80 billion to spend money on quality improvement that would use up money that they could spend making people healthy. 
When they try to accredit, they ask themselves, are we doing our job across these dimensions? Are we doing assessment functions? Are we doing policy development functions? Are we doing assurance? So first they assess, then they go about making policies to react to their assessment of public health needs, and then they do things to assure that the population is being healthy. The details are in here. When you are assessing health, you monitor health to see what are the current problems. You will investigate outbreaks and lead to the diagnosis of what is making all these people sick, what are the root causes. Under policy development, part of the policies are informing the people what is making us sick. What can we do together to get the power to solve it as a partnership, as a community partnership? What can we all do together, politicians and the people in moms and dads and sisters and brothers do? And what can we as a health department do? What can the hospitals do? Everybody works together to develop policy and own it. Then the assurance functions, there'll be some laws and regulations, mandates for masks or vaccines, making sure sick people can get care, making sure that the people doing the assurance are, are effective. At the center, there is research and systems management and evaluation. So we can actually make a list of the 10 essential public health functions that go into this procedure. I just went through them in the rainbow wheel to talk about monitoring and diagnosing and forming, and they all can be classified according to these three basic pieces of the public health wheel, assessment, developing policy, and assurance in a wheel. They come as both top-down and bottom-up. In the top-down method, the health department says, we're the leader of the team. We will do a thing to you. We will hire a team to go out and stop malaria by handing out bed nets. We will go and vaccinate you by driving up to your house and giving you vaccine. We will do it to you, and I'm the conductor, and I'm going to do all this to you. The bottom-up method says, let's have circle time. Let's all get together and discuss what is making us so sick right here? What can we all do as a partner, as a team, to solve the problem? The reality is that the top-down stuff feels better to you public health majors and you MPH students and everybody who wants to be a public healthy, wants to be the boss of things. Bosses have more fun and they just save lives millions at a time. However, I'm not knocking it, you gotta do that too, but the, the let's all get in together, this mobilizing community partnerships is so important and so helpful, especially now when you see people saying, I don't agree, I don't trust you, you're not on my tribe, you're not on my team. If we had done this mobilization 10, 20 years ago and built these partnerships, we wouldn't be in the predicament we saw during the coronavirus pandemic. So community engagement is a bit of a lost art. It does require skills in facilitation and convening. And if you just go to medical school or nursing school, not sure they're teaching you the community organizing part. Divided nations and divided communities are often cohesive down at a micro scale of your street or your apartment building. They're united because they have faces and there's a rule of rescue involved and you're, you're my neighbor. They're forced to share proximity and forced to solve the problems that are right outside their door. They all have the town drunk and it's their uncle. Uh, they all share the same noise and air and water, stray cats, face mask problems. And so they will actually be much more cohesive at solving it than you could imagine a nation of hundreds of millions of people can be. So public health says it's our job to solve health disparities. Um, it when it works, it doesn't require the vulnerable people to get up, drive down to a clinic and say, fix me. You fix the ecosystem. You fix the social determinants. You create role models that exercise and eat granola and broccoli. You change expectations of what do people do when they're caring about each other. And of course, you do change the physical environment. Furthermore, you manufacture solidarity when you're an effective public health officer. You get people together to say, we share the problem, we have to share the solutions. Now, public health still has an Achilles heel. It's still funded by 
paltry, measly state and local taxes, woefully underfunded. And if you're a county, especially a poor county or a sick county, you depend on transfers from rich and healthy counties. The state legislature has to move money from the rich suburbanites out to your sorry, sick county. And a lot of myopic politicians don't get elected by moving money from their rich counties to the poor counties. Furthermore, if you want to cut a budget, cut the public health budget. Nobody is, is, is protecting it. There's no citizen saying, please fund our public health department. Now, it's not just lack of money. The workforce in public health is not amazing. They're mired in the past. Uh, they're very content running clinics for tuberculosis and STDs and HIV, promoting more breastfeeding. They love that old last century stuff. It's what they went to school on. So there's this weakness in this new wave of community mental health services that can actually prevent despair, create uh, a support system for people undergoing trauma, stopping these pathways to addiction and obesity. And the workforce is just not about community organizing, community collaboration. Some are. The front, the front of the profession is there, but uh, we have a lot of catching up to do. And you, as you come out of your health economics school uh, and health economics class, could play a role in fixing public health for the future. The post-coronavirus country that we all could work together to create needs to do this much better. So let me summarize. We've talked about a concern for disparities. We've been, talked about how we have to move beyond simply utility of goods. We do get utility from who we think we are as our identity, how we feel about others, and what we stand for. The utility of equity and health includes those feelings and that identity. And so we can see the rule of rescue because we care more when we can see somebody. We can see paternalistic altruism setting up. Policies to achieve equity have to consider both process equity and outcome equity because what? Process equity doesn't automatically lead to outcome equity. Remember the Whitehall study, it happens all the time. Lastly, I showed you what public health departments can do in this space. They exist everywhere and they can do so much better if they learn to rise to the occasion and if they were funded to do their job. They would use mechanisms of targeting uh, and blanketing and community engagement, which is the future of public health and the future of solving health disparities. So thank you very much for coming to this lecture and I hope I've inspired at least one or two of you to consider your role and your future in creating a solution to health disparities.